Hi there and welcome to The Daily Gardener and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 9th and we have 39 days until the first day of spring. Today we celebrate a man who published his garden journal in a book and inspired countless gardeners and garden writers with his resonant words. We'll also learn about a young botanist with drive and good intentions, as well as a personal beef with another botanist. And both of these men had a dramatic impact on the Calcutta Botanical Garden. Today, we'll also hear some fascinating words about tree bark and pH. It's a little discussed topic, but it's a good one. And we grow that garden library today with a book that helps us cook with flowers. And then we'll wrap things up with a look at winter chores for this week from 1889. But first, I just wanted to remind you that you can always head on over to the dailygardener.org. That's the dailygardener.org. And once you're there, you'll see all of the show notes for every single episode, in addition to blog posts for botanical history, all of the book recommendations, and all of the poetry that's been shared on the show. It's all there waiting for you. And Also, when you're there, you can sign up for the free Friday newsletter. This is a little email from me to you. It comes out every single Friday, and it's like getting a garden letter from a friend. I also share botanical history and literature to tide you over the weekend, along with gift ideas and recipes and exclusive updates regarding the show. So if you get a chance, head on over to the website, sign up for the newsletter, and have a look around. Here's today's curated news. Today's curated news comes from MarthaStewart.com, and the post is about jade plants. The title is, Jade Plants Are the Low-Maintenance House Plants everyone should know about. And I thoroughly agree with that because jade plants do make wonderful house plants. Their botanical name is Crassula oveda. And they're also commonly known as the lucky plant or the money tree or the money plant. Now, one thing to keep in mind with your jade plant is that these plants originate from the Cape province of South Africa. So as much as we love them as houseplants, they are native to South Africa. And that provides a clue as to how to take care of these plants. I'll never forget the summer a few years back when one of my student gardeners had a grandmother who was dying from breast cancer. And she mentioned that her mother had no idea how to take care of her mom's houseplants after she passed on. And she wondered whether or not I would be willing to take one of her grandmother's houseplants. And I said, sure, that would be fine. And one day her mom showed up with the most huge jade plant I'd ever seen. It was in basically the equivalent of a five gallon bucket. And the jade plant was about two feet tall and two feet wide. And I noticed immediately that it was waterlogged. And I could just imagine what had happened that after grandma passed away, the family was trying to keep her houseplants alive and they were watering them. And in the case of the jade plant in a container that was poorly drained or had poor drainage, they just had watered this thing and had I not received it at that time, I'm pretty sure it would not have lasted much longer. So the day that I got it, I just let it sit outside. It was a hot day and I thought, okay, tomorrow I'm going to figure out what I want to do with this, find the pots that I wanted and so forth. And so I picked two terracotta pots, which are perfect for a jade plant because they're very breathable. And then using soil that was heavily perlited to keep the soil nice and light and fluffy and well aerated, I then proceeded to split this plant into two plants so it was a little more manageable to deal with and then I washed as much of the soil 
the old soil away from the root structure as I could. And there's not much root structure to a jade plant because all of the water is retained in the stems and the leaves. And then I repotted it. I repotted both of them. And they're actually with me right now up here at the cabin. One of them is sitting in front of the deck door on an antique plant stand. And the other one is up in my bedroom. And every morning when I get up, I look out to see the lake and I see this beautiful jade plant. It's very architectural. It's very beautiful. It's tall. And then Sometimes as some of the branches of this jade plant can grow in different ways, sometimes in ways that I don't like, I'll just snap those off and then put those in the soil so that they can grow and be a whole new plant. But that's basically what I do with my jade plant. And this wonderful article by Martha Stewart that was featured over on MarthaStewart.com uh, offers input from Lisa Eldred Steinkopf, the houseplant guru. And she is fantastic. So I love that she's part of this. Lisa points out that they can actually flower if you have enough light. And they also retain the water in their leaves and their stems, which is a little unusual because sometimes plants do one or the other, but not both. But jade plants do that. In any case, if you would like to check out this article for yourself and learn a little bit more about jade plants, all you need to do is the next time you're in the Facebook group for the show, just search for the word jade and this post will pop right up. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group for the show, the listener community, it's very easy to join. All you need to do the next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the English gardener and writer Henry Arthur Bright, who was born on this day, February 9th in 1830. As an adult, Henry began a diary, which would become a book called A Year in a Lancashire Garden. Henry's book is one of the most beloved garden biographies of the 19th century, and Henry's book inspired future garden writers like Henry Nicholson, Ellicombe, Teresa Earle, and Elizabeth Lawrence. And I thought I would share today a February 1874 excerpt from Henry's journal. And although this was written almost 150 years ago, Henry was doing what gardeners do this time of year, worrying about how the winter would affect his garden and noticing the progress of the earliest blooming trees and shrubs, cleaning up and editing the garden for the new season, looking through his garden magazines for new and old plants, experiencing some disappointment in the spring showing of some of his flowers, in this case his aconites, and mulling over why some spring flowering bulbs go unappreciated like the humble spring crocus. So without further ado, here's what Henry wrote. We've had the sharpest and keenest frost, sharper than we've had all winter. Now spring has come again, and as Horace says, has shivered through the trees. The elders are already unfolding their leaves. A lanicera or honeysuckle is in the freshest bud. I remember when, a few years ago, Mr. Longfellow, the American poet, was in England, and he told me he was often reminded by the tender foliage of an English spring of that well-known line of Watts, where the fields of paradise, quote, stand dressed in living green. And I thought of this today when I looked at this very Lanicera. But all things are now telling of spring. We have finished our pruning of the wall fruit. We have sown our earliest peas. 
We have planted our ranunculus bed and have gone through the herbaceous borders, dividing and clearing away where the growth was too thick and sending off hamperfuls of peony, iris, onothera, snowflake, Japanese anemone, daylily, and many others. On the other hand, we've been looking over old volumes of Curtis's Botanical Magazine and have been trying to get, not always successfully, a number of old forgotten plants of beauty and now of rarity. We have found enough, however, to add a fresh charm to our borders for June, July, and August. On the lawn, we have some aconites in flower. This year, they're doing badly. I suspect they must have been mown away last spring before their tubers were thoroughly ripe, and they are punishing us now by flowering only here and there. Then, too, the crocuses are bursting up from the soil, all gleaming in purple and gold. Nothing is more stupid than the ordinary way of planting crocuses in a narrow line or border. Of course, you get a line of color, but that is all. And for all the good it does, you might as well have had a line of colored pottery or variegated gravel. They should be grown in thick masses and in a place where the sun can shine on them, and then they open out into wonderful depths of beauty. Besides the clusters along the shrubberies and the mixed borders, I have a number of crocus on the lawn beneath a large weeping ash. The grass was bare there, and it was well to do something to veil its desolation in the spring. Nothing can be more successful than a mass of crocus, yellow, white, and purple. I sometimes think that the crocus is less cared for than it deserves. Our modern poets rarely mention it, but in Homer, when he would make a carpet for the gods, It is of lotus, hyacinth, and crocus. And today is the anniversary of the early death of the promising English botanist and naturalist William Griffith, who died on this day, February 9th in 1845. William's peers in Madras, India, honored William with a plaque that says, He attained to the highest eminence in the scientific world and was one of the most distinguished botanists of his age. William was exceptionally bright and fit. Confident and capable, William made one discovery after another on his expeditions across the globe. But in researching William, while I discovered a man who was unquestionably intelligent and driven, he was also embroiled in a personal battle against a fellow botanist, an older peer named Nathaniel Wallach. One of the greatest botanists of his age, Nathaniel was in charge of the botanical garden in Calcutta, India. And during his time in India, he wrote a flora of Asia, and the palm Wallachia distica was named in Wallach's honor. In 1824, Nathaniel was the first person to describe the giant Himalayan lily, Cardiocrinum giganteum, the largest lily species in the world. And if you decide you'd like to grow a Himalayan lily, and who wouldn't, expect blooms any time after year four. Now, Richard Axelby wrote an excellent in-depth paper that shares the sad story of dislike and mistrust between William Griffith and Nathaniel Wallach. It's a fascinating read, and it underscores the damage that can be done when people don't get along. 
In a nutshell, when William arrived at the Botanical Garden in Calcutta, he essentially played the role of the new sheriff in town, and he didn't like the way that Nathaniel had organized the garden. He didn't like Nathaniel's arrogance and adherence to the old ways. And for his part, Nathaniel hadn't anticipated this kind of challenge to his authority. He had hoped to finish out his final years respected and revered until he received his pension and returned to England. When Nathaniel's health deteriorated, he was forced to leave the Calcutta Botanical Garden, and he went to the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa to recover. During his absence, William went to work, and after being put in charge of the garden, William set about executing a complete renovation. In hindsight, William's personal feelings likely got in the way of exercising a more thoughtful redesign. He essentially threw the baby out with the bathwater. For instance, there was an avenue of stately cycas trees that was beloved by visitors of the garden, and they were wiped out. William's total dedication to organizing the garden by classification meant that aesthetics and common sense were secondary and that proved detrimental to the garden. Plants that had thrived under the canopy of established trees and shrubs were suddenly exposed to the harsh Indian sun, and they burned and perished out in the open. And even if he could be a difficult man to work with, it's hard not to imagine the shock Nathaniel experienced when he returned to the garden in the summer of 1844 and saw the complete devastation in every bed, every planting, and every corner of the garden. Nothing was untouched. It had all been changed. And as Nathaniel returned to the garden that summer, William was preparing to leave. In September, he married his brother's wife's sister, Emily Henderson, and by the end of the year, on December 11th, he quit and he left the garden for good. Two months later, on February 8th, 1845, Nathaniel poured out his pain in a letter to his old friend, William Hooker. He wrote, where is the stately, matchless garden that I left in 1842? Is this the same as that? Can it be? No, no, no. Day is not more different from night than the state of the garden as it was from its present utterly ruined condition. But no more on this. My heart bleeds at what I'm impelled daily, hourly, to witness. And yet, I am chained to the spot. And the chain, in some respects, is of my own making. I will not be driven away. Lies, calumnies, every attempt to ruin my character, publicly and privately, are still employed. They make my life miserable and wretched. They may break my heart, but so long as my conscience acquits me, so long will I not budge one inch from my post. Well, when Nathaniel wrote this letter, William and his bride Emily were back in Malacca in southwestern Malaysia, but all was not well. William had gotten sick on the voyage to Malaysia. It was hepatitis, and he had languished for 10 days. And the very day after Nathaniel sent his letter to William Hooker about his broken heart at seeing his dear Calcutta Botanical Garden, William Griffith died on this day 
in 1845 in Malaysia. He was just 34 years old. In Unearthed Words, today's words are from the New York Times bestselling author, Tristan Gooley, from his book, The Lost Art of Reading Nature Signs. And this is from his section called Bark. Each tree's bark will have its own pH, and some are more acidic than others. Larches and pines are notoriously acidic. Birch, hawthorn, and oak are acidic too, but slightly less so. Rowan, alder, beech, linden, and ash are less acidic again, and willow, holly, and elm are getting closer to neutral. Sycamore, walnut, and elder are alkaline. And the less acidic the bark is, the more growth you are likely to see from colonizing plants and lichens. Pine bark is often bare, whereas sycamore might have a glorious guest hanging off its bark. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Cooking with Flowers by Misha Bakker. This book came out in 2013, and the subtitle is Sweet and Savory Recipes with Rose Petals, Lilacs, Lavender, and Other Edible Flowers. In this book, Misha put together more than a hundred recipes to create beautiful, flower-filled dishes for your table. This botanical cookbook features creations that will speak to any gardener. Sweet violet cupcakes, savory sunflower chickpea salad, pansy petal pancakes, chive blossom vinaigrette, daylily cheesecake, rosemary flower margaritas, mango orchid sticky rice, and herb flower pesto. Misha is an herbalist, chef, and an owner of a custom confectionery studio, so she's an expert in preparing and using botanicals in the kitchen. Misha shares how to find, clean, and prep edible blossoms. There's always a trick to this, and Misha has mastered it. You'll learn that the color and flavor of various blooms can infuse vinegars, vodkas, sugars, frostings, jellies and jams, and even ice creams. This book is 192 pages of edible flowers, visually stunning desserts, and one-of-a-kind creations. You can get a copy of Cooking with Flowers by Misha Bakker and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $6. And I just had a thought that this book would make a wonderful Valentine's Day gift. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, February 9th in 1889, that the Lancaster Gazette shared a little snippet about the garden chores that should be done this week. So let's see how our chores stack up against the gardeners from the late 1800s. Here's what they wrote. Outdoor work must have a full share of attention. Whatever winter work remains must now be cleared up or the consequences will be serious. Make quickly a thorough clearance of the vegetable quarters. Prepare all plots requiring manure at once, as it is much better to have the manure completely incorporated with the soil than to sow or plant immediately after manuring. The ground for peas, beans, onions, cauliflowers, and broccolis must be liberally manured and deeply stirred. 
mark out the quarters for onions into four-foot beds and raise the bed six inches above the general level and leave the surface rough. At sowing time, the surface will be nicely pulverized through exposure to the air, and the seed can be set clean and rolled in firm. Choose for potatoes, ground on which cabbage or broccoli or celery has been grown last year. Make up sloping borders under warm walls and fences for early lettuce and radish and prick out broccoli and cauliflower from seed. Plant. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending part of your day with The Daily Gardener. If you want to read even more botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories, biographies, and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can easily share your gardener greetings or book submissions by emailing me at jennifer at the dailygardener.org. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>